Robert Eggers' 2022 film, The Northman, will certainly leave you with something. Be it the gruesome murders, questionable growling, or weird-ass mother-son relationship, it will be, yeah, something. I watched this film as a part of an Icelandic sagas course, and that definitely gave me an interesting perspective. I think I can say that whatever you may take from this film, you can count on its depiction of medieval Icelandic society. While his films can blur the lines between reality and magic, Eggers has become known for his attention to historic detail with his films The Witch and The Lighthouse. So just how accurate is The Northman? It would be academically irresponsible to answer this question in such a broad sense. So to gather an understanding of how accurate the Northman is, we have to look at how accurate certain parts of the film are. But before we hop into specific aspects of the film, I want to take a moment to look at what was going on behind the scenes to ensure accuracy. Eggers hired numerous experts to serve as historical consultants to the production of the film, including archaeologist Neil Price, folklorist Terry Gunnell, and Viking historian Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdottir. Eggers also co-wrote the script with Icelandic poet and novelist Sjön. Furthermore, the actors spent a significant amount of time rehearsing how to use the historical objects they interacted with on screen. For example, members of the cast practiced rowing a Viking longboat in sync. Eggers did not allow the boat to be towed or for the use of a small motor. So clearly, he paid some attention to historic detail while crafting this film. Now, to look at the locations seen in the film, Eggers would decide what type of place the scene's action should take place in, and then that set would be built based on the remnants of real places around the north. For example, when it came to the forts at the start of the film, everything from how the trunks of trees were placed to build walls to the gantries on top were based on sites in Denmark and Sweden. However, some adjustments had to be made due to the lack of information available. Also, the decorations in Arvandil's royal hall were inspired by artifacts found in the Ulsbrug ship, which is one of the most famous and well-preserved Viking burial sites to date. Furthermore, the majority of armor, clothing, and weapons in the film are inspired by artifacts that were found in different Viking graves and carvings. Moving on to look at specific events and characters in the film, let's start with our North man himself, Anlip. His name and story might seem familiar to you, and I mean, if you're familiar with Shakespeare's Hamlet, that's why. The character Amleth seems to first appear in an ancient Scandinavian folktale that was first written in Saxo Grammaticus's The History of the Danes, around the same time that the prose Edda was written. The name Amleth comes from the old Icelandic Amlothi, which the meaning of is in question. Some believe that the ending Oldi could be the same as in Odin, which would mean mad, crazy, or angry. But the beginning, Am, is tricky. The Old Icelandic Almulvi becomes Anmada in the Old Danish of Saxo's time when the History of Danes was written. The Latin version of this became Amlethas, and then finally the French take the H and move it to the front, giving us Hamlet. Even outside of the name, our buddies Hamlet and Amleth have similar stories. In the film, we watch Amleth bow, quote, I will avenge you, father, I will save you, mother, I will kill you, Fjolnir. End quote, which is essentially the same as Hamlet, who kills his uncle to avenge his father. Now, another important person, or group, in Old Norse society were berserkers. We see these warriors at the start of the film, once Amlet has grown older, wearing wolf hides. In the scene, they hype themselves up, drop their hides, and proceed to attack a settlement bare-chested. In legend and the sagas, berserkers are warriors who fight in a trance-like fury, which gives rise to the word berserk in modern English. The tales say that when these warriors fight, they become the animal skins that they are wearing. They quite literally turn into wolves. So the question is why Eggers would have had them shed these hides before fighting. The answer to this could lie in the meaning of the word berserker itself. The serk part of the word means shirt or skin, but whether the burr part means bear or bear is in question. I think Eggers' decision to have them drop the skins could be a way of paying honor to the fact that we don't really know what bear meant for berserkers. 
Otherwise, the ritual that the berserkers do to prepare for the invasion of the settlement is rather accurate. The idea that they would do a sort of dance, rhythmically beat drums, and mimic animal noises to put themselves into a sort of tranced state for battle is generally accepted. This ritual unlocks levels of ferocity that they need to commit the violent atrocities that they do. But it also contributes back to the idea of shapeshifting, which is an incredibly prominent form of magic in Norse myth. Through the ritual, they become the beasts they are intimidating, and while this isn't literally the case, it is absolutely the case in their minds. Written descriptions from the Byzantine about people fighting with vikings describes the berserkers as moving and making noises like animals. And again, this scene further contributes to Egger's blend of reality and myth. Also, for any film enthusiasts or aspiring filmmakers, the berserker raid scene is pretty cool as it is done almost entirely in one shot and works as a great example of how a long take can be effective. Turning to a couple of events that seem to be rather accurate, the ball game that takes place after Amleth has traveled to Iceland where the youngest son of Fjolnir is almost killed by a raging player occurs very similarly to accounts of the game in sagas such as Ihil Saga. The game is an ancient Icelandic hockey style sport that is called Pinatleker, and boy is it brutal. If you thought modern day hockey fights were bad, just wait until you hear of the game from Ihl Saga, in which Ihl was paired against a boy named Grim and began to lose. This angered Ihl, who then grabbed an axe, quote, ran up to Grim and drove the axe into his head right through to the brain, end quote. Later on, when he was 12, Ihl would play games alongside Borg. In one such game, the two were playing against Ihl's father, Skalagrim, who was, quote, filled with such strength that he seized Borg and dashed him up to the ground so fiercely that he was crushed by the blow and died on the spot, end quote. The Northman really hones in on this brutality as the players nearly beat each other to death in the scene. In an interview, Egger said that, quote, some historians think that they didn't actually keep score. It was all about who's the last man standing, end quote. It's pretty clear that the filmmakers used these written accounts of the games to craft a rather accurate scene. Later on in the film, after Amleth has killed Thorir, the elder son of Fjolnir, we are graced with a funeral scene. And my goodness, this scene is the spitting image of a Rob Envoy Ibn Fadlan's written account of a Viking funeral from around the year 900. This account is considered to be one of the best, as it is incredibly detailed and unlike most, it is not influenced by Christianity. While Ibn Fadlan has his own biases, his account provides another angle through which to see Viking life than the Christian angle that we usually have. On top of written accounts, archaeological evidence such as the Ospergship offered insight on how burials in the Viking Age were set up. This all comes together to allow Eggers to create a rather accurate depiction of a Viking funeral. The scene in the Northmen follows Ibn Fadlan's account word for word, as we first see a young woman lifted up over the edge of what Ibn Fadlan describes as a door frame three different times as she chants what is essentially, quote, I see my father and my mother, I see my dead relatives, I see my master and paradise, and he calls me to him. The woman then sings and an older woman leads the rest of the funeral. From the written account, we know this woman to be called the Angel of Death. And by the end of the ceremony, she will kill the younger woman who is meant to be a willing sacrifice. We then watch the Angel of Death place Thorvir's sword on his body, and we can see that other belongings and offerings are there to be buried with him. Evidence for this exists from both Ibn Fadlan's account as he writes, quote, they placed his weapons beside him, end quote, and from the Osper ship as things such as kitchen utensils and implements for textile work were found. After that, Thorvir's younger brother slaughters a horse, which is also accurate according to the Osper ship where the skeletons of some horses and an ox were found, and to Ibn Fadlan's writings where he mentions that chickens, cows, dogs, and horses were killed and placed on the dead's burial boat. Finally, the sacrifice drinks from a horn as the others in the room holler and bang on their shields and she is repeatedly stabbed by the angel of death. This is also similar to Ibn Fadlan's account as he writes, quote, the men began to bang on their shields with staves to drown the sacrifice's cries so the other slave girls would not be frightened. 
the archaeological evidence of the Osper ship also suggests that human sacrifice was a part of noble Viking funerals, as the ship held the bodies of two women, one who was likely noble and the other who could have been a sacrifice. The scene cuts away before we can see what is done to Thorbeer's burial ship, but we can assume that it would have been burnt or buried, as Ibn Fadlan's account recalls the burning of a ship and the Osper ship offers evidence that they were also buried. Before moving on to another topic, let's talk about the dream Amleth had in which a Valkyrie screamed and it appeared that she had braces. We'll talk more about Valkyries a little later on when we talk about the film's connections to Norse mythology, but the braces on her teeth were an intentional and accurate decision on the filmmaker's part. When looking at Viking burial sites, archaeologists found bodies that had shaved teeth. Neil Price, the archaeological consultant on the film, explained that Vikings would, quote, file horizontal grooves across the front teeth, end quote, and that a few teeth would be carved into pointy V-shapes. Furthermore, these grooves were likely filled with a sort of tree resin that would be a dark red or black color. So the braces seen on the Valkyrie and the Northmen are not modern braces, but more so a form of teeth tattoo. However, these dental modifications have only been found on men at this point. So Egger's choice to put them on a Valkyrie was not exactly accurate though it is fitting for his blend of reality and magic in an artistic sense as it associates her with a sort of ferocity and, as a Valkyrie, she is a being of war. Moving on to talk less about specific people or events and more about Viking society and thought, we're going to take a look at how accurately the Northman employs Norse mythology. We see quite a few references to mythological tales throughout the film, with some being more obvious than others. In general, these Norse myths drive Amleth and provide values and guidance for what to do with his life. Towards the beginning of the film, he comes across a Cirrus, who reminds him of his vows to avenge his father and shares a prophecy with him. This Cirrus practices a form of magic called Seder. Typically, this magic is practiced by females, though some men practice it at the cost of being ridiculed. Nevertheless, the film also has a male practitioner of Seder. Really, these people provide a connection between the realm of myth and reality, which is incredibly important for Egger's blending of the two. This is also where the influence of the Norns of Fate come into play. It is said that the Seeress is a Norn, as she is always seen spinning a thread of wool in her fingers, which symbolizes the fate and life of Amleth. This prophecy and the idea of fate really drive all of Amleth's actions throughout the film, which seems to be accurate to medieval Icelandic life, as throughout the sagas, prophecies tend to always come true and the characters are very focused on their fate and what they must do to lead a life of honor. We also see ravens being used as a motif throughout the film, with Amleth being freed from captivity by ravens after he killed Fjolnir's son. This inclusion is appropriate for Norse society as ravens were held in high regard. To the Norse, they are birds of prophecy and protection, with two ravens being associated with Odin as they act as his eyes on Earth or Midgard. The inclusion of these birds alludes to Odin's presence around Amleth, which is incredibly important to him, especially because of his beliefs of Valhalla. In myth, Valhalla is a hall within Asgard that is for those who die while in combat. This is where Odin is building an army of the best Viking warriors in order to assist him in his fated fight with the wolf Fenrir, and to aid him during Ragnarok, the death of the gods. However, it is said that only half of those who die on the battlefield go to Valhalla, with the other half going to Folkvanger, a meadow that is overlooked by the goddess Freya. Nevertheless, many characters, including Amleth, see dying in battle as a great honor, and they wouldn't want to die anywhere else which is rather accurate to the Viking lifestyle. This brings us back to the Valkyrie, whose task is to choose which warriors to bring to Valhalla and which to bring to Folkvanger. In the Northmen, we see Valkyries twice, both times as Amleth has visions of journeying to the afterlife, which leaves their actual existence up for interpretation. They absolutely could be a psychological manifestation of Amleth's core beliefs as he is hurt and dying or Egger could be blending magic and reality by bringing them into existence. So, while the Valkyrie's appearance was much more artistic, as they are mythological beings and Eggers didn't have much evidence to work with aside from artistic renditions, their actions and purpose in the film seem very fitting for Norse mythology. Now, taking a look at the Viking mindset itself, and specifically the Viking man, 
Eggers paid a lot of attention to the mind and thoughts of saga characters in order to accurately develop Amleth and the characters in the Northmen. While reading the sagas, Eggers really liked how even the heroes were not perfect. They were psychopaths and outlaws, so to Eggers, Amleth was an anti-hero. The character is obsessed with revenge and the idea that he is bound to his fate. This is like Hamlet who is consumed by vengeance. The difference is that Amleth has no problem seeking revenge and Hamlet enters an existential crisis over it. This makes sense as in Christian societies being humble is seen as good whereas in Viking society honor and legacy were incredibly important, with feud and revenge being a major part of that. Now, in terms of the Viking man or masculinity in the Viking Age, Eggers was faced with navigating some rough waters. This is especially prevalent when it comes to the Berserkers. There are plenty of uncomfortable modern associations that come with Viking men and unleashing the beast. Viking raids were horrific. The men brutalized, violated, and enslaved thousands of people, and this sort of violence was also felt at home through feuds, civil warfare, and domestic abuse. And even with that, some people today tend to glorify the masculinity of Vikings and their militaristic strategies, which is an absolute mistake. In an interview, Price expressed that, quote, the thing is that they do terrible things, and they are seen to do terrible things, and that is important. I personally really don't want anybody to come out of that scene and want to be a Viking." End quote. These men were not heroes. Choosing to highlight Amla's brutality and flaws instead of hiding them and painting a picture of a great yet humble and righteous Viking man is more accurate to the sagas and the Viking mindsets and prevents promoting a harmful and toxic stereotype about masculinity. In the end, while I didn't personally like this film, I can really appreciate the attention to detail that was used. I found the film to be funny and somewhat entertaining at times, but yeah, Viking stuff just isn't my cup of tea. Please don't ask me why I signed up for a class about Vikings. If you're into Vikings, or anything medieval for that matter, I'd suggest giving this film a watch, as it truly does make a good effort to piece together a historically accurate story from a society in which much historical evidence has been lost or tainted. Anyways, thank you all for watching today's video. If you have any thoughts to add or movies you'd like me to take a look at next, leave a comment below. Also, please consider leaving a like and subscribe to support me. As always, be good people, love others, and love yourselves. Peace.